All right, thank you so much. Yes, thanks for the invitation to be a part of this uh, this great series too. Um, so yeah, what I what I wanted to talk about today uh, is mostly on older work, um, but I thought it would be a, a fun thing for this series. Um, and in particular, uh, I'm going to talk about the exotic uh, unitary irreducible representations of de Sitter space time. Um, and I'm gonna focus on two uh, of these representations. So I'm gonna talk about partially massless particles. And I'm going to talk about uh, shift symmetric scalars in de Sitter. Uh, and curiously, the relationships between these two types of particles. Um, so I should say, um, please, I hope that, uh, I see that everybody pretty much has their cameras off, uh, but I hope that people are interactive uh, and please feel free to ask questions uh, at, at any point during the talk. Um, okay, so when we write down uh, an EFT, um, the fundamental building blocks that we use are uh, the irreducible representations, uh, usually of the Poincaré group. Um, and what's interesting is that when we start to think about de Sitter space-time rather than flat space-time, uh, it turns out that there are uh, particles that you don't have in flat space-time that have no good uh, flat space analogs. Um, so these are these partially massless particles. Um, in addition to which, there are some uh, scalar field theories in flat space-time that have some very special properties. Uh, so these are these shift symmetric scalar fields. Um, and it turns out that when you try and write down the analog theories in de Sitter space-time, um, that these have even more exotic properties uh, in de Sitter space-time. And furthermore, uh, these shift symmetric scalars in de Sitter are in fact, uh, have close relations to the partially massless particles. And so it's, it's really this interplay that I want to focus on today. Um, so first to give some background, uh, what I'm gonna be focusing on uh, to start uh, is on non-scalar bosonic particles in de Sitter space-time. Uh, and so like in flat space-time, uh, we can generically uh, classify these uh, as two different types. Uh, so we have massive particles uh, in de Sitter space-time, uh, but now, Unlike uh, in flat space time, uh, they obey a slightly more complicated unitary, unitarity bound that tells us that the mass of the particle squared has to be greater than this particular combination uh, of the spin of the particle uh, times uh, the Hubble constant of the de Sitter space time. Uh, so this is what's known as the Higuchi bound. Uh, and it's simply a unitarity bound for massive particles in de Sitter space time. Um, in addition to massive particles, uh, we also have uh, particles which we can classify uh, as massless or partially massless. Uh, so these are particles whose masses satisfy the following relationship. We can write m squared uh, as equal to s, uh, where s again is the spin of the particle times s minus one, uh, minus a parameter I'm going to call uh, t, which is referred to as the depth of the particle. Uh, so t times t plus one, uh, h squared, like so. Uh, so t is the depth, uh, and it's allowed to run from zero to s minus one. Um, and so the masses of these particles take on discrete values relative to this Hubble constant. Um, in particular, uh, we see that the massless representation, so the representation for which m squared is equal to zero, uh, corresponds to the depth t equals s minus one particle. Um, on the other hand, when we have t is equal to zero, uh, we saturate this Higuchi bound. So we should think of these massless and partially massless particles as a series of discrete points below the Higuchi bound that are unitary, leading up to the Higuchi bound, at which point our representation simply become massive. Uh, so t equals zero, this is going to saturate the Higuchi bound. Um, and all of the particles in this category, so the massless and partially massless particles, uh, these all exhibit gauge symmetries. Okay, so let's look at a couple specific examples just to be a little bit more explicit about what's going on. Um, so for example, let's just start with the usual uh, spin one particle. Uh, 
Uh, so when we have S is equal to one, um, we can write down a massive spin one particle in the sitter, uh, which is simply going to be a particle that obeys M squared greater than zero. Um, and this is going to propagate uh, the usual plus or minus one and zero helicities. All right. On the other hand, if we look at the massless or partially massless representations, we see that there's only one uh, that corresponds to t equals zero. So this is going to be the massless representation. So we're going to have t equal to zero, uh, which is going to give m squared equal to zero. Um, and what's going to happen is that, um, so as I said, the massless and partially massless particles have gauge symmetries. What the gauge symmetries do is they remove the lower helicity components uh, of the higher spin particle. And in particular, the uh, depth parameter T categorizes which low spin components get removed uh, from the particle. So for the depth T equals zero particle, it's the zero helicity component um, that gets removed from the representation. So the T equals zero uh, massless spin one particle uh, only propagates the plus minus one helicities. Uh, so in fact, what we're seeing is just for spin equals one in the sitter, the story is in fact the same as it is in flat space time. This is nothing new. There are no new representations here. So in fact, things only start to look a little bit different when we go to higher spin. Um, so if we do the same thing for spin two. So now we're going to have for the spin two particle, for the massive spin two, we see that it obeys the non-trivial Higuchi bound that M squared has to be greater than two H squared. Um, and now this is a particle that's going to propagate uh, the plus or minus two, plus or minus one and zero helicities. And now we see that we have two possible values for T. So we can have T equal to zero or T equal to one for the spin two particle. Um, so when T is equal to zero, again, we have the usual massless representation Sorry, when t is equal to one, we have the massless representation. Uh, so this corresponds to m squared is equal to zero. Uh, and the gauge symmetry is going to be responsible for removing uh, the lowest uh, three helicities of the massive spin two particle. Uh, and so this is a particle that's only going to propagate plus or minus two helicities. All right, but now uh, if we look at the depth t equals zero uh, spin two particle, we see that we get one of these representations that doesn't have a flat space analog. Uh, so when t is equal to zero, uh, the mass of the particle m squared is exactly equal to two h squared. Uh, on the other hand, this particle, as we'll see, has a gauge symmetry. And this gauge symmetry is responsible for removing the helicity zero component of the mass of spin two particle. So in fact, this is a representation that propagates the plus or minus two uh, and plus or minus one helicities like so. And so this is what gets referred to uh, as a partially massless particle. Excuse me, can I ask you a naive question? Please. Uh, is it clear why in the massless usual case when t is equal to one, why do you remove one zero minus one and not just one or minus one? Yes, this is very naive. So why uh, in the usual massless case, when you said t equals to one, that means that you are removing three values of the helicity? Oh, uh, yeah, you can, you can see this from the form that the gauge symmetry takes. Um, so t is a, is a useful way of parametrizing this, um, but, but yeah, you have to, you have to look at uh, the form of the gauge symmetry to see which helicities are getting removed from the particle. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll in fact, we'll do this with the, um, with the partially massless particle. Can I ask a question as well, Rachel? Yeah, is there, please. Is there a concept of sort of a little group, little group here? Um, so I think because you're in the sitter space time, you can't define the, the little group the way that, that you usually do uh, in flat space time, because there, there is no like abelian subgroup um, of the de Sitter group in the same way that you have uh, in flat space time. Um, so it's the, what we mean by mass is, is more complicated. And in fact, that's, that's precisely related to why um, the unitarity bound in the Sitter uh, 
has spin in it. It's because all of these generators mix with each other. I see. Uh, and so there's not, and so when you construct these representations, there's not like a kind of induced representation approach? Yeah, no, not, um, yeah, what's the right way to think? Not, not in the same way that you can do in, in flat space time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay, uh, so let's look more carefully uh, at the spin two particle. Uh, so if we focus on spin two, uh, so let me draw a little plot uh, where we compare the mass of the particle uh, to the Hubble constant of the de Sitter space time. Uh, and what we're basically saying is the following. Uh, so first of all, uh, for particles that live along uh, the m squared equals zero line right here, uh, these are just your usual massless representations. Uh, and these propagate the usual two degrees of freedom. Um, but now we can also consider particles that live along this line uh, where we have m squared is equal to two h squared. Um, so this is our partially massless particle uh, that propagates four degrees of freedom. Uh, and now what's going to happen is that for values of m squared uh, that are in between zero and two h squared, uh, what we find in fact is that the representation is non-unitary. So this is a forbidden region over here. And also uh, as well for m squared less than zero, uh, we're going to have everything uh, m squared less than zero. We're dealing with a tachyonic particle. So this is also a non-unitary representation. Um, on the other hand, in this uh, sort of trapezoidal region over here, this region describes a unitary massive spin two particle. Uh, so in here, we have a massive spin two particle that propagates five degrees of freedom, like so. All right, um, and whether I'm in de Sitter space or anti-de Sitter space uh, depends on which side of this M squared line I'm on. Uh, so we're assuming H squared is positive, I'm in de Sitter space time. Um, and h squared is negative, I'm in anti de Sitter space time. All right, so what does the Lagrangian look like just for the free theory? Uh, so there are a couple of useful ways that I can write this. Um, so I can express the Lagrangian uh, of the free uh, massive massless or partially massless spin two particle in de Sitter uh, in terms of the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian. Uh, expanded out to quadratic order uh, around the fixed de Sitter background. Uh, so here we've expanded g mu nu uh, as g bar mu nu uh, plus h mu nu up to quadratic order in h mu nu. So this is the kinetic term. Uh, and then we add a mass term. Uh, and in particular, we add the Fierce Pauli mass term. Uh, so this is going to look like m squared over 2 h mu nu h mu nu minus trace uh, of h squared, like so. All right, and what we find um, is that when uh, we have uh, m squared is precisely equal uh, to two h squared, uh, this theory has a gauge symmetry as promised. And so this theory is invariant under the transformation, delta h mu nu is equal to covariant derivative d mu d nu plus h squared g mu nu times alpha. And so it's precisely this scalar gauge symmetry that's responsible for getting rid of the helicity zero mode of the massive spin two particle. All right, we can write this in a slightly more compact way um, by defining an invariant field strength. So we can define uh, an F mu nu lambda which is equal to covariant derivative mu h nu lambda minus d nu h mu lambda, in which case the same Lagrangian L, um, we can simply rewrite uh, as minus one fourth f lambda mu nu, f lambda mu nu minus twice f lambda mu mu, f lambda nu nu, like so. Um, and so the point is that uh, this invariant field strength that we wrote down is itself uh, identically invariant 
um, under this gauge transformation here. Uh, so the Lagrangian uh, then by default uh, is also invariant under the gauge transformation. Um, and this puts it in a form that makes it look a little bit more similar uh, to just usual electromagnetism. Uh, now in this theory, there are conserved charges associated with the fact um, that you have this gauge symmetry. Uh, and, in the and the conserved charges uh, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with what are known as the reducibility parameters of the theory. Uh, so we have conserved charges. And these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the reducibility parameters. Um, which are simply uh, the solutions to the equations for the gauge parameter that you get when you set the gauge transformation equal to zero. So these are solutions to the expression uh, delta h mu nu is equal to zero. So in other words, delta h mu nu uh, equal d mu d nu plus h squared g mu nu alpha is equal to zero. Um, it turns out that it's easiest to solve this equation um, by going to embedding space coordinates. Uh, so in the embedding space, uh, we represent our de Sitter space time as the usual hyperboloid in the embedding space. Um, and let me label the embedding space coordinates by capital X's uh, with index capital A. So my embedding space coordinates are going to be some capital X, capital A. Uh, and it turns out that this condition in the embedding space uh, is nothing other than the condition uh, that partial derivative A, partial derivative B of alpha is equal to zero. Um, okay, so this makes it very easy to solve uh, in embedding space. We simply find uh, that alpha is going to be equal to uh, some constant CA times uh, or contracted with the embedding space coordinate, capital XA, like so. All right, so pulling back uh, onto the de Sitter hyperboloid, what this means in fact is that we have five conserved charges because there are five independent solutions of this equation. So one for each direction in the embedding space. Uh, so when we pull back onto the de Sitter hyperboloid, uh, we can identify our five uh, solutions as alpha A of little x um, is equal simply to capital X A of X, like so. All right, so these give rise uh, to five conserved currents. So we can use uh, these five reducibility parameters to construct the five conserved currents of this theory. Uh, and these take the following form. So these are going to look like J mu nu of A is equal to F mu nu lambda, D lambda alpha of A. Uh, and these conserved currents obey uh, D mu J mu nu A is equal to zero. All right, and then from these five conserved currents, uh, we can define in the usual way five conserved charges. So we have five conserved charges. The QA are going to be the surface integral, say over some sphere S2 uh, of the dual uh, of the conserved currents like so. So this works exactly as it does in, for example, electromagnetism. Um, the interesting thing there though, um, is that in electromagnetism, there's only one uh, reducibility parameter for the associated gauge symmetry. And so there's only one conserved charge, the electric charge. Uh, what's interesting is that for the partially massless case, even though it's still a scalar gauge symmetry, uh, there are actually five independent uh, conserved charges associated with the scalar gauge symmetry. Um, and these five charges, they transform uh, as a vector uh, in the fundamental representation of the de Sitter isometry group. So this is, we should really think of these uh, alpha A as a vector. Um, and of course, what we're interested in um, is what's the physical interpretation of these charges. Um, so we should ask what is the invariant charge in this theory? Um, and so the invariant charge is going to uh, be given by taking the de Sitter invariant norm uh, of these five charges. Uh, 
Uh, and then there are only two possible, well, there are two independent possibilities, I should say. Uh, the norm of these charges uh, could be space-like or it could be time-like. Uh, and so really there are two invariant independent charges. Um, so two possibilities. Uh, depending on whether norm is time-like or space-like. Okay, again, so what is the physical meaning of these charges? Um, well, one way we can see that uh, is to take this theory and take the flat space limit um, and see what these charges become in the flat space limit. Uh, so we have to be careful uh, in how we take the flat space limit um, because we want to remain on the partially massless point that gave us uh, this gauge symmetry to begin with. So we have the condition uh, that m squared is equal to 2h squared. And so to take the flat space limit, we're going to send both m and h to zero in such a way that this relationship is maintained. Um, so we're going to take both of these to zero. Um, and what's going to happen is the following. So we had uh, this partially massless Lagrangian, the LPM. Uh, and what's going to happen if we're really careful about what's going on with the various helicities in the flat space limit um, is that we're going to end up with two decoupled free Lagrangians. One of these is just going to be uh, the Lagrangian for a free massless spin two field. Uh, so we just are going to have uh, the quadratic piece uh, of the Einstein-Hilbert uh, Lagrangian. And this is just going to propagate the plus or minus two helicities. But then there's going to be a separate uh, decoupled Lagrangian uh, that is basically just a, a Maxwell term. So it's the Lagrangian for a massless spin one particle. So the plus or minus two helicities and the plus or minus one helicities have completely decoupled from each other in the flat space limit. Uh, so this is just L, E, and M. Uh, and this is where the plus or minus one helicities are hiding. Um, okay, so in fact, uh, in the flat space limit, uh, the Lagrangian that we end up with has more symmetries than the partially massless Lagrangian did. Uh, so the Einstein-Hilbert uh, Lagrangian has the full uh, linearized diffeomorphism invariance. Uh, so this is invariant now under delta H mu nu uh, is equal to D mu psi nu plus D nu psi mu, uh, whereas E and M has the usual gauge symmetry. So we have the usual U1 gauge symmetry. Uh, delta A mu is equal to D mu lambda. OK, so what happened to the partially massless charges? Um, what do these become in the flat space limit? Well, we can see what happens uh, to the partially massless gauge symmetry in this limit. Uh, so we started out with D nu, D mu. Uh, h squared g mu nu alpha is equal to zero. And now if I take the flat space limit, um, so sorry, so these are, this is the equation for the reducibility parameters. Uh, this equation is simply going to become uh, d mu d nu alpha is equal to zero in flat space. Um, and this is in 4D flat space now, not in the embedding space. All right, so this has two possible solutions. Uh, it has a solution alpha is equal to a constant, uh, and it has the solution uh, that d mu alpha uh, is equal to some vector, say psi mu, uh, which is itself equal to a constant, like so. Okay, but this is nothing other uh, than the reducibility parameter of our u1 gauge symmetry, um, and this is nothing other uh, then the reducibility parameter emerging simply from uh, the translation part of diffeomorphisms. So this is just translations over here. All right, so what we're seeing, so these are the five reducibility parameters. So what we're saying is that in the flat space limit, the five charges of the partially massless theory simply become the electric charge, the charge of the U1 theory, um, and the four translations um, of the massless spin two particle. So in particular, uh, in the flat space limit, um, our two invariant conserved charges are nothing other than mass and electric charge. 
All right, but what's interesting is that in the partially massless theory, these things actually mix with, e with each other, which is somewhat unusual um, for masses and electric charges. Okay, so why are we doing all this? So we're doing this because uh, these reducibility parameters are going to become relevant um, when we think about uh, the, the shift symmetric scalars, which is the next uh, unusual representation of the sitter that I wanna talk about. So where do these emerge? How are these related? Um, to the partially massless particles. Maybe I should stop and see if there are any questions. Okay. So does does uh, the same thing happen with higher spin? Do you get this decoupling in the same way? Uh... Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and in, that's um, that's how you see that like the partially massless particles don't have a flat space analog. Um, because what happens when you take the flat space limit is that the irreducible representation just becomes reducible. Um, and so you get you get tower, you get sort of Lagrangians of decoupled uh, massless particles, um, usual massless particles in the flat space limit. Um, it's only when you're on de Sitter that, that these very various helicities mix with each other under a de Sitter transformation. And in, and in flat space, and these these higher spin masses particles, there are sort of um, you know consistency relations that fail, right? Uh, like unitarity, or uh, you, if you calculate certain amplitudes of these things, you find uh, uh, inconsistencies. Is that also seen in the de Sitter space as well? Or? Yeah. So I I think because we don't have we don't have the same like S matrix tools, right. um, I'm not sure how to see it in that language. But I I think there's a there's an assumption that that they should they could potentially be as pathological as they are in the flat oh, yeah. in the flat space case okay. um okay thanks yeah okay uh so let me go back to this diagram that i drew earlier uh of the spin two particle in the sitter uh where we were plotting m squared versus h squared uh, and we said this line was unitary and this line was unitary uh, and these regions were non-unitary. Uh, and this is where we had M squared equal to two H squared at the partially massless point. All right, so now let me suppose that I start uh, with a usual just massive representation in Sitter. So I'm somewhere out here in parameter space uh, and I have M squared greater than two H squared um, and so I'm describing a particle that propagates the usual five degrees of freedom. Uh, and my Lagrangian is going to look like the usual free Lagrangian. So I'm gonna have the Einstein-Hilbert piece uh, and the Fierce Pauli mass term, like so, h mu nu, h mu nu minus h squared. All right, and this is gonna propagate five degrees of freedom. All right, so now I wanna know what happens to this theory uh, when I take the parameters to the partially massless point. So what happens now if I, for example, keep h fixed, um, but I send m squared to 2h squared. So I send the parameters such uh, that I hit this line over here. So let's take uh, m squared to 2h squared. So just tuning the parameters of the theory shouldn't change the number of propagating degrees of freedom in the theory that I'm describing. And so what's gonna happen when I take this limit and if I take it carefully uh, is the following. So the Lagrangian that I'm gonna get is going to be the Lagrangian for the partially massless spin two particle that we wrote down before. Um, and then this is going to propagate uh, the four helicity modes, so the plus or minus two and the plus or minus one. But in addition, there's going to be a Lagrangian for the helicity zero mode that's now decoupled from the partially massless particle. So in addition, there's going to be uh, a Lagrangian for a scalar field that's going to look like the following. So minus one half d phi squared, uh, minus, let me call it ms for mass of the scalar squared over to phi squared, like so. And so this is where uh, the holicity zero mode of the massive spin two particle has gone. So this whole Lagrangian is still propagating uh, the right number of five degrees of freedom. Um, and in particular, uh, this mass of the scalar field, ms squared, uh, is going, we find is equal to minus four h squared, like so. Okay, now what are the symmetries uh, of this theory that we've written down at this partially massless point? So we have, we still have the partially massless transformation uh, of the spin two particle. Uh, so this is invariant under 
uh, dh mu nu is equal to d mu d nu plus h squared g mu nu alpha. But now interestingly, the scalar field uh, has its own symmetry transformation. Um, and that's simply that uh, d phi, and I'm going to write capital phi uh, for simplicity because I'm going to write the transformation in embedding space just because it looks much nicer there. Um, so this is nothing other than embedding space phi. So the scalar part of the Lagrangian is invariant under the transformation that d phi uh, is equal to c a x a, where again, these are my embedding space coordinates. All right, so this should look familiar um, because this transformation is nothing other than the reducibility parameter of the partially massless transformation. And so what's happened is that um, the scalar field, so this decoupled holicity zero mode has in, in fact inherited this symmetry transformation um, from the partially massless transformation. Um, and so the transformation that it sees uh, is in fact nothing other than the reducibility parameter of the partially massless transformation. Um, and it takes this very specific form of a, of a shift type symmetry, like so. Um, and it only happens uh, at this particular value of the mass. So it's for this specific value of the mass um, that this free scalar field exhibits this shift type symmetry. All right, so is this unique? We can ask what happens uh, for higher spin particles. Um, so for example, we can consider the spin three case. So if I look now uh, at the unitarity diagram uh, for a spin three particle, um, so if I have M squared, I have H squared. Uh, so if my mass is above, uh, M squared is equal to six, h squared, um, then I'm in a unitary regime for the massive uh, spin three particle. Um, anything below this, any mass below this is going to be non-unitary, uh, except for the discrete lines. So we have a discrete line as always uh, at m squared equal to zero. Um, but now there's also going to be a discrete unitary line uh, at m squared is equal to four h squared, like so. OK, but everything else in here is non-unitary. All right, so this particle here, uh, this is nothing other than uh, the T equals zero, uh, partially massless spin three particle. Uh, this is the T equals one, partially massless uh, spin three particle. Uh, and again, this is nothing other than the usual uh, totally massless uh, spin three particle, like so. All right, so now we can do a similar exercise. Um, we can start with a representation that's in the unitary massive regime. Uh, and we can ask what happens to that representation uh, when we send the mass to 6h squared. Uh, and what we're going to find uh, in this case is the following. Uh, so our Lagrangian, again, is going to decouple in this limit. Uh, so we're starting with a particle with m squared greater than 6h squared. And then we're going to take m squared precisely to 6h squared. Um, I should say, maybe just to be very explicit, so for the massive uh, spin 3 particle, um, we propagate the usual plus or minus three, plus or minus two, plus or minus one, and zero helicities. Um, the T equals zero partially massless particle um, removes the lowest helicity component, so the helicity zero component. So this guy here only propagates uh, the plus or minus three, plus or minus two, uh, plus or minus one. For T equals one, we just get plus or minus three and plus or minus two, et cetera. And obviously massless, we just propagate uh, plus or minus three. Okay, so now uh, if we do this exercise, uh, our Lagrangian against decouples, uh, and we get the Lagrangian uh, for the partially massless spin three particle. Uh, and again, we get a Lagrangian for the scalar field, uh, which is now going to look like the following. So we have minus one half d phi squared uh, minus m s squared over two phi squared, uh, and now m s squared. Uh, is going to be equal to minus 10 h squared. All right, and we can ask uh, what's the symmetries of this Lagrangian. Um, and so the spin three particle is just going to exhibit the usual symmetry of a partially massless spin three particle. Um, so that's going to look something like the following. So we can call it, say, delta of L 
mu nu lambda, and this is going to be equal to d mu d nu d lambda symmetrized uh, and plus four h squared g mu nu lambda of alpha. Um, but again, the scalar field in this theory uh, is going to be invariant under its own transformation. Um, and that's going to be a shift symmetry that takes the following form. So we're going to have delta phi uh, is equal to some constant C A B times embedding space coordinates X A X B like so. So we can think of this as being like a higher order shift symmetry. Okay, so what, what is the general statement? What are we saying here? Uh, so the statement that we wanna make is the following. So generally, uh, in the sitter space time, uh, we can write down the Lagrangian for a free massive scalar. So if I take a Lagrangian uh, minus one half d phi squared minus some m sub k squared over two phi squared like so, and I consider certain discrete values of the mass. So in particular, I consider uh, m's such that m sub k squared is equal to minus k times k plus three h squared, then add these values of the mass. This simple free Lagrangian uh, is going to uh, have one of these shift symmetries. So in particular, uh, for a given value of k, uh, it's going to have the shift symmetry delta phi is equal to c a one to a k and x a one to a k where these C matrices that appear in front um, are simply constant, symmetric, and traceless matrices. Um, and what's interesting about this tower of scalar fields um, is that they can all be understood um, as the decoupled helicity zero mode of a partially massless particle. So for all of these, you can consider, you know, partially massless particles of arbitrary spin, uh, you can send that, uh, sorry, you should consider first a massive particle of arbitrary spin. Uh, you should send the mass to the partially massless point, the t equals zero partially massless point. What's gonna happen is the massive representation is going to split into a representation of a partially massless particle and a scalar field. Um, and the scalar field is going to uh, be one of these scalar fields that exhibits these shift type symmetries. All right, so a few things to note. Um, so hey, first of all, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. That's going one way. If you went straight to flat space, instead of going first to the, the partially massless line, does that, yeah. does it, does that work? Does um, that commute? Yeah, I guess? no, so it, it doesn't commute. So what's gonna happen if you go um, to flat space first? Um, so you'll get a massive representation. And then when you, uh, when you send, uh, let's see. So I guess in that case, in that case, there's no sense in which uh, you can send then the mass to the partially massless point. Um, so you could then say, for example, take the mass to zero. Zero. And yeah. what would happen in that, yeah. And so what would happen in that case is you would just get um, a tower of the various helicity modes and the, the zero helicity mode would just be a free massless scalar. Um, okay. So I said, okay, good. Yeah. So I should say it works in a certain sense that like, if you take, um, so you want to take H squared to zero first, right? Yeah. So in that case, what you would end up with is a free massless scalar. Um, and that in fact has a, like an infinite tower then, of these shift symmetries. Yeah. Um, and I'll, yeah. And I'll talk about that for a sec, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't pull out a specific one of these shift symmetries uh, like you would get into sitter space time. I follow up that question uh, a little bit. <clears throat> so if there's an issue of ordering of limits um, there, what happens if I just take that theory uh, and, I, and I regard the, you know, the parameters in the Lagrangian as being the thing that ultimately is gonna control the Hubble scale and the mass, and I just start integrating out modes and I ask how do things flow under the normalization group? Does, does the, you know, are, are these lines that you need to approach flat space on to see these special features, are they a normalization group uh, trajectories, or are you, do you flow onto that line, or do you flow away from that line? Is it because uh, that'll be relevant for any naturalness kind of questions, right? 
Yeah, so I, I think that's a, it's a really good question and it's really hard to answer because pretty much the only thing we know about these theories, we know about the free theories. And as soon as you add interactions, you almost, especially for the partially massless theories, you almost inevitably violate these symmetries. And so it's hard to even think about what the interacting theory would look like where you would actually have a partially massless symmetry that you could flow to at a given point. Um, so I, I think your, your question would be important if there was an interacting theory that potentially exhibited the partially massless symmetry. I don't know how to answer it in the absence of that, of that kind of theory. But it, it might be better actually to have the, the special properties have more symmetry than the generic theory does because that might be a way by, by which the renormalization, that, that symmetry might be what makes the renormalization group follow that trajectory. Whereas if the symmetry says they're all the same, it wouldn't really give you a preference as to where you flow. So, so if you just if you just did the stupid thing and just you know embedded it into some theory that has interactions that do not respect the symmetry, is there a sense in which the symmetries emerge at low energies as you integrate stuff out? Um, as, not not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Because you might hope that as you flow to a, a you know a non-interacting fixed point for the couplings, things would be free in that limit, and maybe it would be true that the free part of it would have this enhanced symmetry. That would be cool. Yeah, that would that would be really nice if that could work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be very cool. Uh, Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, maybe to follow up quick on the about the interactions. Um, so if you if you tried to write an interaction and then uh, took the flat space limit, I get in flat space it would be well defined. So um, what would happen there? Uh, so I, I guess the issue is that, um, so, okay, so there's a, for the scalar theories that we're talking about, um, we know how to write down the interacting theories, um, and those have a very well-defined flat space limit. You just get the analogous, uh, shift symmetric scalar fields in flat space time. Um, for the partially massless particles, um, we don't have consistent interacting theories in de Sitter space time. Um, and so you could... Yeah, it's it's yeah. I'm not sure how to answer your question because the we don't really have a good theory that you could an interacting theory of the partially massless particles that you could take a good flat space limit of. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's um, yeah, yeah. There's nothing to start from, I guess. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess, I guess the exception, um, so Kurt Hinderbickler and, and Chris Bruss have written down like Vasiliev type theories um, for these partially massless uh, spin two particles. Um, and I, I would imagine that what happens there in the flat space limit is that you, um, yeah, you just get, I think it becomes infinitely strongly coupled, um, but okay, yeah, that's, that's the only example that I know about. Okay, yeah, that's interesting, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, a few things to note uh, about these theories. Um, so as you probably noticed, um, in de Sitter space-time, um, this is in fact uh, a tachyonic mass. So this is always a negative mass in de Sitter. Um, but it turns out that at least in terms of the symmetries, um, nothing that I've been saying so far about the scalar fields um, is specific to de Sitter space-time. Um, so in fact, you can write down the same Lagrangians uh, in anti de Sitter space time. Uh, and there you would have M squared uh, is equal to plus one over L squared, uh, where now L is the anti de Sitter uh, curvature radius uh, times, K, uh, times K plus three. Um, and this is a perfectly normal massive spin zero particle in ADS uh, and is perfectly unitary. Um, and so you might think uh, in de Sitter space time, because these have the wrong sign mass terms, um, these must be uh, pathological, these must be non-unitary representations. Um, but in fact, we have a few arguments as to why, even though the mass has the wrong sign, we think that these particles might actually belong to exotic unitary representations of the de Sitter group. Um, so one is simply the fact that uh, in doing this exercise, when we started with a massive particle uh, and took uh, the limit to the partially massless point, um, we started from a fully unitary representation. Um, and so by continuously deforming um, the representation, we wouldn't expect to arrive at something non-unitary at the end of the day. Um, and I should say that this is in contrast uh, to what's going on 
with other shift symmetric particles. So it turns out that you could do the same thing uh, and approach the other partially massless points um, within these diagrams. And what you would find is you would find higher spin particles that exhibit uh, various shift symmetries. So in particular, in this case here for the spin three particle, um, if you were to approach the T equals one partially massless point, um, you would find that it's a, a vector that decouples from the representation. Um, and this vector uh, exhibits its own type of shift symmetry. Um, and the vector also has a, a negative uh, mass squared term. But in this case, because you're starting out uh, in a non-unitary regime of the theory, we actually don't expect this vector to belong to a unitary representation of the de group, whereas it seems plausible in the scalar case that they could. Um, and just another sort of back of the envelope argument that we have um, is you can actually look at uh, the norm uh, of these scalar fields using global de Sitter coordinates. Um, and what you find is that sure enough, there are a number of modes that are non-normalizable um, precisely because you have this tachyonic type mass. Um, but it turns out that there's only a finite number of non-normalizable modes. Um, and they're in exact correspondence with the number of shift symmetries that you have. And so you can imagine that the shift symmetries, you could treat them like a gauge symmetry um, and they could be responsible for removing the non-normalizable, the finite number of non-normalizable modes of these scalar fields, uh, in which case you would be left with a healthy unitary representation. Um, and so it, it would be nice to have a, a more rigorous argument, um, but we have some evidence that um, even though these scalar fields have wrong sign mass terms, they might actually be exotic unitary representations of the de Sitter group. Okay. All right, so why are these even interesting? Um, why do we care that we find these shift, shift symmetric uh, scalar fields in de Sitter space time? Um, so we can take a brief interlude uh, and look at what's going on in flat space time. Yeah, may I ask you? So, um, yeah. yeah, so actually, what prevents from showing explicitly that these are unitary representations? So, you have this non normalizable mode that you cannot introduce the norm for them, basically. Is, is that the, the problem? Yeah, that's right. I and mean, we don't really know the, the right way to handle the non normalizable modes. I see. And but, but what would be the proof then? So because yeah, you say you, you, you think of kind of removing or kind or introducing a different norm that would treat these non-normalizable modes as gauge. So they should have zero norm, I believe. Then. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um what we what we think should happen is that it's actually the field strength of these scalar fields that should be a that should be treated like like the conformal primary. And this is the thing that should have. Um, the positive norm, but we don't we we don't know how to define what that norm is on the field strength. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Very good. Um, so uh, to consider the simplest possible theory in flat space time, and in fact, this goes back to the question that Tom was asking earlier. Um, we can just see what's going on uh, with a massless scalar field. Uh, in flat space time. Uh, so if our action looks something like the following, uh, d four x minus one half uh, d phi squared, like so. So this is our free massless scalar. Uh, what's interesting about this theory uh, is that it actually enjoys an infinite number of shift symmetries. Um, So in particular, it's invariant under the transformation. Uh, delta phi is equal to C plus C mu x mu plus C mu nu x mu x nu plus and so forth. Uh, so in other words, we can write this as a sum from k equals 0 to n uh, of C mu 1 mu k x mu 1 x mu k, like so. All right, so this is in contrast to what's happening uh, in the de Sitter case, um, where it's really only at discrete values of the mass um, that you get invariance under one of these shift symmetries. But you can see that if you were to take this theory here um, and you were to take the flat space limit, uh, 
Uh, so you were to send h to zero, then m is simply going to be equal to zero. Uh, and in fact, you're going to be left with a flat space limit that's going to be invariant under this entire tower of symmetries as well. Um, now, what happens in flat space time is that as soon as you add interactions, you can't preserve all of these symmetries. Um, but what you can do is you can try and add interactions in such a way um, as to preserve a subset of the symmetries. Uh, so I don't have too much time, but just to go through somewhat quickly. Um, so we want to add interactions uh, to preserve a subset of symmetries. Uh, so for example, if we want to preserve the k equals zero symmetry, so this is just our delta phi is equal to c, um, we can do this with any theory that has at least one derivative per field. Um, so in particular, uh, we can write down a p of x type theory. Uh, so if we have x uh, is equal to minus one half d phi squared, then any l uh, equal to p of x is going to preserve just this usual uh, shift symmetry. Okay, and of course, P of X theories uh, have a long history in cosmology and other fields. Um, they're notable too because they uh, have a special soft limit. So, in particular, uh, if you consider uh, tree level processes uh, in the limit that the momentum of an external leg goes to zero, uh, so you have A of P in this limit, uh, you find that this is going to be proportional to P to the sigma, whereas for these P of X theories, um, you have that sigma is equal to one. So in other words, A goes to zero uh, in the limit that P goes to zero. And that's a, this is the usual Adler zero um, and is a special property of these P of X type theories. Uh, you can ask for interacting theories uh, that preserve the K equals one symmetry. So this is going to be the shift symmetry uh, such that delta phi is equal to C mu X mu. Um, and the thing about this is that trivially, any theory that contains at least two derivatives per field is going to preserve this symmetry. But as soon as you start writing Lagrangians um, with higher derivatives per field, uh, you generically have ghosts. You have higher order equations of motion, um, and these will lead to Ostrogradsky type ghost instabilities in your theory. And so the question is, can you write down an interacting theory um, that preserves this symmetry um, but that doesn't propagate ghosts, propagates the correct number of degrees of freedom. Um, and it turns out that there is a finite number of interactions that can do this. Um, and in particular, uh, you have the Galileans. Um, and you can also write down uh, DBI action. Uh, so the Galileans realize this symmetry uh, in an abelian way. Uh, the DBI action realizes the symmetry in a non-abelian way. So in particular here, you have delta phi uh, is equal to C mu X mu uh, plus C mu phi D mu phi. Um, but both of these are examples of actions uh, that maintain or extend this given shift symmetry um, without having ghosts in the equations of motion. Um, and like uh, the P of X theory, uh, these theories also have a special enhanced soft limit. In fact, uh, for these theories, uh, they have sigma is equal to two. Okay, and then the third uh, type of interacting theory that we can write down um, is the K equals two theory. Uh, so this has the symmetry, we wanna maintain the symmetry delta phi is equal to C mu nu X mu x nu, uh, where trace of c is equal to zero. So again, trivially, any interaction that has three derivatives per field um, is going to exhibit this symmetry, but is also generically going to have ghosts. And so the trick is, can you write down a theory uh, that maintains the symmetry that doesn't have ghosts? Um, and it turns out uh, that there's a unique theory that does this, uh, and this is what's known as the special Galilean. Uh, so this was identified uh, in terms using uh, the soft limits uh, by Cliff Chung and collaborators uh, in 2014 um, and identified as a special Galilean uh, by Hinterbickler and Joyce. 
uh, in 2015. Um, and this theory has even better soft behavior, so it has sigma equal to three. Um, okay, so for k is greater or equal to three, um, from the field theory side of things, uh, there's no known way uh, to write down an interacting theory in flat space time that preserves the higher order shift symmetries without having ghosts. Um, and in terms of the S matrix uh, approach to these theories, um, there's no corresponding theory uh, that has an enhanced soft limit that also has a consistent S matrix. Um, and so we have reason to believe that for these higher order shift symmetries, um, they simply don't allow consistent interacting theories. All right, so this is the flat space story with the shift symmetric scalars. Um, and what's happened is that in the first part of the talk, um, we basically identified at the free level, um, the Desitter analogs of the shift symmetric scalars of the scalar fields that in the corresponding scalar fields that in flat space time have these enhanced soft limits and other nice uh, S matrix properties. Um, what we've done is identify what these theories look like in Desitter space time. Um, and you can now ask a similar question. You could say, well, in the sitter, um, do, can you write down interacting theories um, of these shift symmetric scalar fields? Um, and it turns out that the story is very much analogous. Um, so for K equals zero, you have P of X type theories. For K equals one, uh, there are uh, straightforward to sitter analogs of the Galileans and of DBI type theories. Um, for K equals two, uh, it turns out that there is a very special analog of the special Galilean, but it's very non-trivial to find. It's not as simple as just taking the special Galilean and embedding it uh, into Sitter space time. Um, so this has a, a crazy looking potential, um, but the cool thing about the theory um, is that the form of this potential uh, is entirely fixed um, by the shift symmetry. So by this K equals three shift symmetry. Um, so it would be interesting to see if this theory has any kind of applications in cosmology um, or elsewhere. Um, and again, so in flat space time, uh, these shift symmetric scalars are known to have really nice uh, S matrix properties. Um, it would be really interesting to know in the De Sitter case, um, what the analog of those properties are in terms of, for example, boundary correlators. Can you see something like the existence of these enhanced soft limits um, for these shift symmetric scalars? Um, and then finally, uh, just to, to end, um, we've talked a bit about interactions for the partially massless particles as well. Um, I think that's a, a much trickier story uh, at the moment than interactions for the shift symmetric scalars, um, but there's some hope that these questions might be related to each other, um, and it would be really cool to try and write down uh, interacting theories that are invariant under these partially massless symmetries. Um, so I think I'm out of time, so let me stop here.